Well, it's always a blessing to be able to stand in the presence of Christ and adore Him for who He is. Well, this past Wednesday, we began our summer series on the family, and I preached a message on God's design for the family, which was uh, just a general overview of what the Bible teaches about the family. And I answered three fundamental questions about the family. What is the family? What is the origin of the family? And what is the purpose of the family? And in my introduction, I explained how the family, as defined by Scripture as one man and one woman united in marriage, plus children that they either produced or adopted, is under a massive attack, not just by our society, but Satan himself, who is hell-bent on destroying this God-ordained institution that serves as the very foundation of human civilization. Understanding that the present cultural crisis is symptomatic of a much larger cosmic spiritual battle raging between God and Satan compels churches and Christians to stand firm against those who have declared war on the family and are seeking not just to define, or or excuse me, redefine the family, but to destroy it altogether. Now surprisingly, there are some within the church who believe that the church itself is responsible for destroying the family because we've incorporated worldly, unbiblical methods that divide families and have led to the demise of the family. If you do a a deep dive into what Scripture says about the family, which I've sought to do uh, in preparation for this series, uh, you will at some point, as you interact with the latest books and articles and blogs, um, come across what is referred to as the Family Integrated Church Movement. It's a relatively new movement within the church that has been around since the late 90s and early 2000s, about 25 years as best I can tell. It's one of many movements that has sprung up throughout the history of the church as a corrective to some perceived problem or deficiency or failure in the church. And as with most movements, there are positives and negatives to the family integrated church movement. And during my preparation for this series on the family, I got sucked into that rabbit hole. And when I finally came up for air, I began to wonder how much of what I just explored would actually be relevant and helpful to share with you. And initially, I was hesitant to even mention it, let alone provide a detailed explanation and critique of the movement. I hope you know by now my primary passion and main commitment as your pastor is to preach verse by verse through books of the Bible rather than preach topical messages that address contemporary issues or that chase every trending subject in our culture. I typically strive to be more exegetical than polemical, drawing from the text rather than uh, other sources to make some kind of argument against something. I also want to make sure that we are always a church that is known for who and what we are for rather than who or what we're against. Are you with me on that? I also try to major on the majors and minor on the minors. In other words, I want to maintain a clear distinction between what are primary issues and what are secondary issues. And most of the time, it's better to address secondary issues in some kind of article or blog or personal conversation rather than to elevate them to a place where they're viewed as an essential issue alongside salvific things like the Trinity or the deity of Christ or the virgin birth or salvation by faith alone apart from works, which you young people just studied uh, this weekend. In other words, things that you have to believe to get to heaven. Furthermore, I never want to devote too much time and attention to matters of conscience and personal preference or opinion, but stay focused on what is clearly black and white in Scripture. Well, having said all that, I decided to preach 
a message on the Family Integrated Church movement for a number of reasons. Number one, while the Family Integrated Church movement is more of a philosophy or methodology of ministry and therefore a secondary issue, it is presented and defended as an essential biblical mandate for every church. And therefore, it's a reason for separation and in some cases, a reason to part fellowship. And some churches believe it's valid to distinguish themselves from other churches solely on the base, basis of family integration. Number two, it's a movement that has exalted personal conviction and preference to the level of biblical principle. In other words, if you don't follow what they consider to be the biblically prescribed method of church, then it is sin. Number three, I think it goes beyond what the Bible teaches and confuses the nature and purpose of the church and blurs the lines between the roles of the church and family and unduly elevates the family alongside the church and in some cases above the church and infringes on the authority of the church. And while this may be an issue you have never even thought about and have already concluded it's nothing you really care about, the present demographic of our church, which has been providentially put together by God, is more likely to be exposed to the family integrated church movement and other Christians, and as such, I think we are more susceptible to the subtle influence of that movement. You say, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is that we have unintentionally attracted a lot of families who have chosen to educate their kids at home. And this particular movement grew up out of and together with the homeschool movement. And so it's part of a, a larger worldview that involves controversial and potentially divisive subjects like home education and patriarchal authority and quiverful teaching. If you're not familiar with that, it's no birth control. And you're supposed to just trust God to decide the size of your family. And don't do anything to stand in God's way. Well, as you can imagine, these kinds of issues can produce elitism and legalism in the life of a local church where families begin to look down on other families if they don't have the same personal convictions or preferences as they do, which in their minds makes them less spiritual and less faithful parents than they are. I know you've never been tempted to do that. You've never experienced that, right? This is just from books I've read. No, actually, I've had families in our church tell me that they've felt judged and shunned by others in our church because of where they send their kids to school. And I know that there are kids in this church who don't feel like they fit in here because they're not homeschooled. Our church has been impacted and will continue to be impacted by this movement over the years, we've had families come to our church from family-integrated churches, and we've also had families leave our church to go to family-integrated churches. Our church runs in some of the same circles as those who embrace this movement, and we benefit greatly from the ministries of some who endorse the family-integrated church model. Guys like Paul Washer and Joel Beakey and Bodie Bauckham and Alexander Strock and Answers in Genesis and G3. And as we're about to see, the whole movement got started in our own backyard. If you consider Texas our backyard. So all that makes it seem to me that the family integrated church movement is particularly relevant to our church. And it's a, really, it's just a great case study in biblical discernment and a helpful lesson on the theology and the history of the church. And so the bottom line this morning is that we need to think biblically about how God intended the church and the family to relate to one another. In other words, what are the respective roles of these two God-ordained institutions? 
I want to organize our thoughts today around four questions. Number one, what is the Family Integrated Church Movement? Number two, who or what is behind the Family Integrated Church Movement? Number three, how can we benefit from the Family Integrated Church Movement? And finally, why we are not part of the Family Integrated Church Movement? I actually consider titling today's message, Why We Are Not Family Integrated Even Though We Should Be. Kind of a play off of a book that was written back in the 2000s when the emergent church movement became popular and Kevin DeYoung and Ted Cluck, who based on their age and demographic of those who they were ministering to at the time, should have been all in on that movement because <laughs> they, were, they were emergent guys. And so they wrote a book with a clever title, Why We're Not Emergent by Two Guys Who Should Be. <laughs> so number one, what is the Family Integrated Church Movement? Well, there's a lot of diversity in the movement, so not everything I may say applies to every church who identifies as a family integrated church. There's no two alike. And aside from their agreement on family integration, churches who align themselves with this movement may vary greatly in in other beliefs and other practices. But generally speaking, a family integrated church is a church where the entire family attends the Sunday worship service together And during the week, kids accompany their parents at prayer meetings in small groups. Typically, there are no nurseries for the babies, no Sunday school or children's church or Awana for the kids, no Camp Glories, that's for sure, Um, no student ministry, no single adult groups. And so they intentionally eliminate any age-segregated ministries from their churches so that families are never separated from one another and children are never isolated from the rest of the church because they believe that this is the pattern and example provided in Scripture and the norm throughout church history. That's critical. They believe that this is the pattern and example provided in Scripture and the norm throughout church history. They claim you can't find any instruction or or demonstration in the Bible of our modern age graded approach to the church, which are in fact worldly traditions and philosophies of men which have been allowed to infiltrate the church. And so in their minds, any programs that separate families by age or gender are unbiblical and unhealthy and destructive to the family. In fact, they are convinced that program-driven churches who divide up the family are the ones who are ultimately responsible for the demise of the family in our culture by the way we've ministered to them. At the core of this movement is the conviction that fathers are the ones God created and called to be the leaders of their families. And they serve as the prophet and the priest and the king. And it is their duty to evangelize and disciple their children rather than relying on Sunday school teachers or youth pastors to do their job for them. Some even think that Sunday school teachers and youth leaders are guilty of competing with the family and usurping the spiritual authority of parents. And if fathers allow their kids to attend Sunday school or student ministry, they're abdicating their responsibility as the head of their home since the Bible forbids any format that allows others to teach your children. So in these churches, the main focus becomes encouraging and equipping fathers to be the pastors and shepherds of their homes. Andreas Kostenberger has provided us a great resource called God, Marriage, and Family. I encouraged you all to get a copy of it this last Wednesday. It's more of a theological overview of the family. And he devoted an entire chapter in his book to critiquing the family integrated church movement. And I thought it was very gracious. It was very balanced uh, in the way he critiqued it. And yet, the family integrated church actually critiqued his critique. And this is how they define the movement in response to the, that, uh, what Kostenberger said. And again, these are their own words, and I quote, the family integrated church movement is part of a determined attempt 
by certain men of God to recover for the family the ground that has been taken over by the church and the state. In this regard, we call both church and state to repent of their sin of trespassing on the roles and duties that God has given to the family. We seek to restore the family to its rightful place in God's economy, no more and no less. Because the family has been pushed aside for so long, our attempt is seen as the undue exaltation of the family by those who have been doing the trespassing. However, our goal is not to exalt the family, but to articulate a biblically balanced view where the importance and necessity of the family, the church, and the state are recognized. In other words, the church has been trespassing on the roles and responsibilities of the family and it needs to repent. That's strong language. Which I think indicates some of the extreme unbalanced tendencies of this movement. Well, let's move on. Number two, who or what is behind the family integrated church movement? Well, two of the original architects and advocates of the Family Integrated Church Movement ministered here in Texas. I first got wind of this new movement about 20 years ago through Vision Forum. I used to receive their magazines. And uh, that ministry, which is now defunct, was based in San Antonio and led by a man named Doug Phillips. Phillips was a pastor at a church in Bernie and an outspoken advocate for homeschooling. He worked as an attorney for six years at the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. Sadly, he disqualified himself from the ministry and was eventually excommunicated from his own church. But at the time, Vision Forum partnered with the National Center for Family Integrated Churches, which is now Church and Family Life, and they hosted a summit on uniting church and family in San Antonio. And this was the first of many conferences all over the nation as the family integrated movement rode on the coattails of the homeschool movement as it, as it surged and, and gained more and more influence within, within evangelical churches. Another key player in the movement, Scott Brown, he's a pastor in Wake Forest, North Carolina. He's the director of Church and Family Life, which hosts conferences and produces resources and connects family integrated churches around the world through a directory of around 800 or so affiliated churches. About four years ago, this organization published what they called a declaration of the complementary roles of church and family, which they described, and I quote, a 21st century statement based on the authority and sufficiency of scripture for the necessity of harmony and biblical order between the separate but complementary jurisdictions of the local church and the family. Well, previously, back in 2011, Brown had written a book called A Weed in the Church, subtitled How a Culture of Age Segregation is Harming the Next Generation, Fragmenting the Family, and Dividing the Church. Guess what the weed in the church is, in his opinion? Youth ministry. He suggested the root cause of the crisis in the church today is modern age segregated youth ministry which is corrupting our churches and sending the next generation of young people on a path of destruction and he argued that God has appointed fathers with the responsibility of teaching their children and that that is how it has always been in the church until recently. Well that was not an original idea. Brown was simply building on the argument presented in a Another book written a few years earlier by the most well-known advocate of the Family Integrated Church Movement, a name I'm sure you're familiar with, Vody Bauckham, who used to be a pastor of Grace Family Baptist Church down in Spring. And in his popular book, which was titled Family Driven Faith, Doing What It Takes to Raise Sons and Daughters Who Walk with God, he became the champion of the Family Integrated Church Movement. He concluded that the reason so many young people walk away from Christ and leave the church is that they've never been 
fully incorporated into the life of the church, but rather segregated into a subculture of the church called the youth ministry. And sadly, in that book, the youth pastor is vilified as the enemy. And the joke was, treated like the Antichrist himself. And he needed to be terminated immediately. Brown and Bauckham's controversial views on youth ministry were eventually documented in a movie called Divided. Some of you may have seen that. And it basically warns people about the dangers of youth ministry and promotes church integration rather than church segregation. While I obviously don't agree with Vody's conclusion in that book, it doesn't change the fact that I appreciate that guy and benefit greatly from his preaching and his writing ministry. In fact, another book is uh, Fault Lines that he wrote that uh, we encouraged all of you to read a few years back when the whole social justice movement and critical race theory hit the church and Vody did a tremendous job of, of walking us through that and helping us think biblically uh, about that whole movement. And so the family integrated approach to ministry is something that I simply choose to agree to disagree on and at the end of the day as I've studied what these guys believe and what they teach and what they've written, I agree with way more than I disagree. I think it's important that we establish this fact that the folks in the family integrated church movement are not our enemies. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are shepherds, not wolves. They are sheep, not goats. They love Christ and his church and they are committed to the sufficiency of scripture. They're dedicated to expository preaching and living holy lives and being faithful to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and sharing the gospel with the lost and dying world and glorifying God in all things. They're totally into Soli Deo Gloria. And so rather than slinging mud at them, we need to be gracious and charitable in the way we talk to them and about them. We should treat them like we would want them to treat us. That sounds biblical. So, in light of that, let's look at number three. How can we benefit from the family integrated church movement? Like I said earlier, this is one of a number of new movements that have risen in the course of church history to correct some real or perceived problem within the church. Unfortunately, their claim that this is always how the church has done it and therefore is the only right way of doing church, I don't believe can be adequately defended from Scripture. It's not that they don't try. They have a lot of verses that they throw at this, but I'm not sure any of them stick. Even so, the movement is not all bad. And there are some things that it gets right that we can benefit from. I wrote down six benefits that we can glean from the family integrated church movement. Number one, it confronts the failure of modern youth ministry. It confronts the failure of much, I should add that. It confronts the failure of much of modern youth ministry. And I'm speaking as a former youth pastor here, And so I appreciate and agree with much of their critical assessment of the worldly, shallow approach of a lot of activity-based youth ministries that simply focus on fun and games and pizza parties and ski trips, and they're led by some young guy with a goatee who has the personality of a game show host and, and likes Mountain Dew and knows how to play the guitar, and he's really good at broom hockey. That was what up, I was up against when I was a youth pastor, trying to carry the biblical mantle of what is, what is true biblical ministry all about, whether you're doing it with adults or students or, or children. It's all the same. And that's why every youth pastor, by the grace of God, we've ever hired has been an elder-qualified, seminary-trained expositor who knows how to preach the word and lead a disciple-driven youth ministry that cultivate a partnership 
with parents to help their kids find and follow Jesus. And so the mission of our youth ministry is the same as the mission of our church. It's to glorify God by proclaiming his word so that people, young people specifically, come to know Jesus Christ and grow to be like him. So I can get behind their critique of the failure of much of modern youth ministry. Number two, it emphasizes the importance of the family. It emphasizes the importance of the family, which is a good thing because the family has been marginalized, not just in the world, but also in the church. Family integrated churches prioritize the family and seek to help marriages and, and families thrive and be the blessing that God intended them to be to everyone involved. And so even if a church is not family integrated, it should be family friendly and family supportive and provide lots of instruction and support for the family, which is why we're doing this series on the family this summer. Because we want to be a help. We want to train and equip families to be all that God wants them to be. Why? Because strong, healthy families make for strong, healthy churches. A third benefit is that it challenges husbands and fathers to be the spiritual leaders of their families. It challenges husbands and fathers to be the spiritual leaders of their families, which is so right and good and biblical. Why? Because the man is the God-ordained head of his family, and all of us men will stand before God someday and give an account of how faithful we were to our responsibility to wash our wives with the water of the word and bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And tragically, more often than not, men fail at this task. They are not faithful, godly faithful leaders in their homes. In too many Christian homes, the wife is the spiritually mature one. She plays the primary role in raising the kids and the nurture and admission of the Lord. Dads tend to be lazy or distracted or indifferent to the spiritual growth and development of their kids, and so they just drop their kids off at church, expecting the children's workers to instruct their kids in the ways of the Lord or drop their teenager off at the curb and pray for a miracle. And Lord, use that youth pastor to fix my kid. It's called curbology. Drop the kid off at the curb, right? And hope for the best. So the Family Integrated Church Movement provides a much needed call for dads to man up to step up, to get in the game and live godly, exemplary lives and take an active role in discipling their wife and their children. And so we applaud any movement that helps men be men. Amen? Number five, it promotes intergenerational interaction within the church. It promotes intergenerational interaction within the church. One of the things I've always been so grateful for about our church is we don't just have a bunch of young people and we don't have just a bunch of old people we got a bunch of everybody and it's such a joy to see uh, every age category represented here at Lakeside Bible Church because you know as well as I do too many church plants these days end up attracting just kind of one demographic they kind of go after the 20s or 30 somethings or maybe it's just a bunch of boomers. Uh, maybe it's the gray hairs. Uh, but, but that's just kind of how it works out. And I think it's important for all ages in the church to worship and serve together. Children and young people have a lot to learn from the older generation of the church. And so they shouldn't stay separated from them the entire time they're at church. When we transitioned about a year or so ago, to two services, the 
the ministry leaders got together and had multiple meetings and we had these long discussions and prayer times about how to minimize the impact on families of going to two services. We didn't want to divide up families unnecessarily, but we wanted them to be able to worship together. And so that's why we staggered you know, our Sunday school and our student ministry in such a way that parents could be with their kids uh, during the worship service, but also so kids could attend the worship service and not just go to Sunday school or student ministry. See, we think it's best for families to come both hours, if you will, so they all can attend not just the worship service, but they can also attend their age-specific class or ministry. So I don't know if you, what kind of habit you're in, what kind of routine you're in on Sunday morning, but we would encourage you to just make a commitment to carve out nine to noon and just say, we're going to be here for, for those three hours because you know, we want to we, we definitely come to church. That's, the big church is the, the priority. And if we only can get to one thing, this is where we're going to come. We're going to come as a family. But our goal is that you would come to the worship service, but you'd also get to take advantage of one of our age-segregated, age-graded um, classes. And we feel like it's a, it's a more balanced approach where it's not an either-or, it's a both-and. Even with our children's church, we're attempting to somehow find the balance and... You know, we have a children's church that we offer for kids up to second grade. It's, a, it's an arbitrary decision about what grade to stop at. But we, we, we revisit it regularly. You know, is that too old? Is that too young? And, uh, but what we're trying to do is minimize the amount of time a kid will stay in ch- children's church. We get them into the church service as soon as possible. And then we get one of those little sheets of paper in the back that, that basically says draw a picture of the sermon because they're not at the age where they can maybe take notes yet, but they can draw. And so they can draw a picture of the sermon. I can't tell you how many uh, funny uh, drawings that have been handed to me after church service by children in our church who gave it their best effort. And... Uh, most of the time, they're not drawing a picture of the sermon. They're drawing a picture of me. And so I got some really hilarious portraits uh, over the years. But again, it's our attempt. Hey, listen. Listen to the preaching of God's word. Draw a picture of what you're hearing and what you're seeing. Number six. Lastly, it provides helpful resources for families which help them understand and fulfill their biblical roles and responsibilities. The Family Integrated Church Movement provides helpful resources for families which help them understand and fulfill their biblical roles and responsibilities. What do you know about family worship? Are you even aware of that concept that, that it would probably be a good idea for you to lead, lead your family men in, in some kind of worship at home as a family? To take out your Bible and just read a verse or two and Talk about it and then maybe sing a hymn and pray or maybe go through a little catechism and ask your your kids some questions and get them to memorize some good theology. You're like, whoa, I don't even know where to begin. Well, there's great resources that thankfully ministries like the Family Integrated Church and and, and church and and, and family life have have developed. In fact, this book right here is an example um, of a very helpful resource. It's called the Theo- A Theology of the Family, Five Centuries of Biblical Wisdom for Family Life. I mean, this is a treasure trove of practical instruction on the family from generations of church history. And, and it's like an encyclopedia of all these articles that they've put together. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful for this. I'm thankful for this. This is a blessing to have resources uh, like this that we can... Um, read and apply to our, to our families. Well, let's consider the last question here. Why we are not a family integrated church. Why we are not a family integrated church. As good as some of it is, why are we not a family integrated church? Which I assume is obvious. Um, that we're not a family integrated church since we just completed kids camp and we got a bunch of kids with t-shirts sitting right here in the front 
um, taking over second service here, who just completed Camp Glory, um, which is an age-segregated ministry for youth. Not to mention the fact we're about to move into our new student center out back there, which in some people's opinion would, is just going to further separate and isolate the young people from the rest of the church. So as you read some of this material and, and try to digest it, you're forced to ask questions like, are we violating God's word? Are we violating God's word? Have we incorporated worldly philosophies into our church? Are we really causing harm to our children and students? And will they walk away from the Lord because of these things? And the most important question is, do we need to fire Kyle? I got you, bro. Well, there's a number of reasons why I don't believe we are violating God's word or putting our kids at risk by providing them camp glories, for example. Number one, the family integrated church movement equates personal conviction with biblical obligation. It equates personal conviction with biblical obligation. And I think the family integrated church movement fails to distinguish between personal preferences and biblical mandates. Which I think is ironic in light of what Vody clearly says in Family Driven Faith. He says, and I quote, it is very important that we live by biblical standards. However, it is equally important that we continually examine those standards to ensure that we don't fall prey to legalism. When we begin to make hard and fast rules based upon cultural norms rather than on the Bible, we will always end up in trouble. And if we have convictions that are not necessarily scriptural, we should admit it. We must be able to say, this is a personal conviction in which I hold myself, not a standard to which God holds all of us. I agree with that. And yet, they insist that age-segregated ministry isn't commanded or demonstrated anywhere in Scripture, so therefore it is sinful. And so I believe they make the Bible say more than the Bible says. And they apply the regulative principle of worship to Sunday school and student ministry. Are you familiar with the regulative principle? It's basically if something is not in the Scriptures, then the church shouldn't do it. And so because the Bible never mentions Sunday school or student ministry or youth pastors, then we shouldn't have any of those things. But just because these things aren't mentioned in Scripture doesn't necessarily mean they are a sinful violation of God's will. I would put Sunday school and student ministry in the category of extra-biblical, where Scripture hasn't said it's right or it's wrong it's it's something the scripture doesn't talk about and so it's extra biblical and when the bible is silent on a matter we have the freedom to do what we prefer as long as we don't violate our own conscience or cause somebody else to stumble and so i think every local church has the freedom to decide whether or not they implement age segregated ministries at the same time leaders in a church should allow parents the freedom to decide for themselves which ministries they utilize as they seek to evangelize and disciple their own children. You could actually operate inside Lakeside Bible Church as a family integrated church person and choose not to use our nursery or take advantage of our youth ministry and we won't do church discipline on you. Nor will we have an usher confiscate your baby at the door. Excuse me, miss, you can't bring that in here. Second reason, family integrated church movement misapplies the old covenant to the church. It misapplies the old covenant to the church. And since most family integrated churches are covenantal, 
theologically rather than dispensational. They see little or no distinction between Israel and the church. And so the old covenant made to Jews in the Old Testament gets blurred together with the new covenant made to Christians in the New Testament. And family integrated churches are convinced that the normative practice for Israel and the early church was to integrate children into all their gatherings. And so they refer to a number of passages of Scripture that are easy to find that show kids present uh, in, a, in a worship gathering, and they use those verses to support a, the family integrated church approach. Deuteronomy 31.12, Joshua 8.34, Ephesians 6, one. the fact that Paul included in his letter to the church in Ephesus something about children that, that, that indicates that he knew they were going to hear that when that letter was read because they were sitting in church with their families. Their favorite verse is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, a passage we looked at on Wednesday. And uh, they appeal to this text to prove that children were included when God's people assembled, and it was the parents' responsibility to instruct their children. This is the passage that talks about uh, a father, uh, parents are to love the Lord thy God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they're to teach their children to do the same, and you know, to teach them the ways of God when they're rising up and when they're sitting down and all throughout the day. Well, there's a timeless principle for sure in this passage that parents should disciple their kids in the ways of God. But I don't think this can be used as a proof text for homeschooling, which it often is, or for being a family integrated church, which it often is. This has nothing to do with teaching your kids Latin or sending your kid to Sunday school. What's more, while Israel was made up of families with heads of households exercising authority over them, the church is made up of individual believers with biblically qualified elders exercising authority, exercising authority over them. So Israel and the church are not the same. And so like I mentioned on Wednesday, the church is not a family of families, but a family of believers. And membership in the people of God in the Old Testament was a matter of physical birth. You became a Jew by being born into a Jewish family. However, membership in the people of God in the New Testament is a matter of spiritual verse. You don't become a Christian by being born into a Christian family, but by being born again into God's family. And what that means is that unbelieving children of believing parents are not part of the church family until they're born again. I know that might rub a few of you guys the wrong way. Wait a minute, that's part of the covenant thing. Well, we need to be careful not to give our children the impression that they belong to God's family and have a duty of behaving like his children just because they come to church, just because they were born into a Christian home, but they haven't repented of their sin. They've not placed their faith in Christ. And I would submit to you that this is part of the reason why the Puritan movement went off the rails because as covenantalists and, and, and pedo-baptists, they, they baptized their babies, which gave them a false sense of security that their kids had some special privilege pertaining to the new covenant, and so that they were going to eventually get saved. Well, guess what? A lot of them didn't get saved. And they weren't able to carry on their deep, rich theological commitments. Number three, the family integrated church movement confuses the roles of the church and the family. It confuses the roles of the church and the family. And so in their attempt to unite the church and the home, these two institutions that God created, the, the, the family integrated church blurs the lines between the distinct roles of the church and the home. And so we have to go back to this Wednesday when I laid out the three purposes or roles of the family. Why did God create the family? Number one, to propagate God's earth, to be fruitful and multiply. And so the family was intended to, by God to be the core social unit in the world and everyone is, be, is, is meant to be part of one and it's the chief building block of any society or civilization and everything else is supposed to build on it. But at the same time, while the family may be the building block of society, it isn't the building block of the church. The building block of the church is individual believers 
who are likened to stones, by the way, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, that are being built into this temple. And yet the Family Integrated Church Movement says families are the building blocks with which churches are made, and so the church should be structured and oriented around families. They even go so far to say on, uh, 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 in some places that, that the family is the foundational institution upon which all other institutions are built and for which all other institutions exist, including the church. So it almost pits the, seems to pit the family against the church or above, put the fam- family above the church. The second purpose of the church is to pass on God's truth. We said that the purpose of the family is to train the next generation in the truth of God's word. But that doesn't also mean that the family is God's evangelism and discipleship plan for the world. The church is. Who did he give the Great Commission to? Families? A bunch of fishermen, tax collectors, his followers. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wasn't talking to dads. And so the church has the responsibility to evangelize and disciple in, in all sorts of creative ways which may include the children and youth of the families who attend that church. And there's no rule in Scripture against dividing up children a few times, perhaps during the week, to evangelize and disciple them as a means of fulfilling the Great Commission and presenting every man complete in Christ, Colossians 1.28. And this in no way takes away from the parents' responsibility to evangelize and disciple their kids in their home. That's still their responsibility. The third purpose of the family is to picture God's plan. We said that God ordained the family to serve as a picture or illustration of his plan of salvation. And throughout the Bible, God compares his relationship with his people to a husband and wife. And at the same time, God compares those he saves to a family, namely children that he adopts into his family who then become brothers and sisters. And he refers to himself as a father who sent his son to die on the cross for his bride, which is not the family, but the church. And just as marriage is a temporary relationship that God created for us to enjoy while we're here on this earth and serves as a picture of our eternal marriage with him in heaven, even so our family is a temporary thing that God created for us to enjoy here on this earth and serves as a picture of our eternal home or family in heaven. Jesus said that there would be no what in heaven? No marriage, which is the beginning of a family, and so what that implies is there will be no family either. That in the same way as Piper says that all of our marriages are momentary, guess what? All of our families are what? Momentary. As opposed to permanent. And in the end, there will only be one family. God's family. The church. And so the permanent family takes priority over the momentary family. And Jesus made that very clear on multiple occasions when he would tell people, hey, if you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, you've got to hate your mom and dad. Now, he didn't actually mean hate your mom and dad. What he meant was that you need to love me more than you love your parents to the point it almost looks like you hate them because you love me so much. And when Jesus' mother and brothers came to get him because they thought he had gone insane and somebody came in and said, hey, your mom and brothers are outside, Jesus said, who are my mother and brothers, those who obey my words. You are my mothers and brothers. Again, Jesus wasn't dissing his family. He was simply making the point that our spiritual family, who we're connected to through the blood of Christ, should take precedence over our own blood relatives. Furthermore, Christ promised to build 
his church, the family of God, not your family or my family. And so therefore our primary focus should be God's family rather than our family. And so rather than expecting the church to integrate into our family, we should integrate our family into the life of the church. I titled this message a church-centered family or a church-integrated family as opposed to a family-integrated church. We should be church-integrated families. Number four, the family-integrated church minimizes the impact of the body of Christ. And so by insisting the family is the sole context of discipleship, I think there's a risk of undervaluing the benefits of having other spiritually mature members in the local church involved in our kids' lives, and we isolate them from the rest of the body of Christ. We're doing the very same thing that we're, we're saying people shouldn't do. We're guilty of that. And again, it doesn't change the fact that parents are primarily responsible to disciple their children, but every wise, humble parent knows we need all the help we can get. And we realize that we we don't have all the necessary spiritual gifts that our kids need to become all that God wants them to be. We're not all eyes, we're not all ears, we're not all mouths. That's why Matt said it so well. It takes a church to raise a kid. So we know we need the rest of the body of Christ to train and equip our children. And so we welcome the input and influence of others in the lives of our kids. Listen, I'm the primary influence in my kids' lives, spiritual influence, but I don't want to be the only voice in their life. I want the truths that I've taught to them be reinforced by as many other godly people as possible from their Sunday school teacher. I praise God for Tom Walters who taught our kids for years. He was just saying the same things we were saying at home. For the string of youth pastors that we've had here that have been such a blessing to our family. And so rather than being a threat, a student ministry should be our greatest resource for change in our kids' lives. Listen, you can tell your kid something a thousand times and he comes to church and his Sunday school teacher says it once. Or his youth pastor says it once, and they come home and they're like, hey, guess what? I learned this today. And you're like, uh, I've been telling you that for five years. But at the end of the day, who cares? As long as they get it somehow, somewhere, from someone, right? I think it's interesting in Titus chapter 2, Paul instructed Timothy, or excuse me, instructed Titus to address, to address distinct age and gender segregated groups in the church, the older women, younger women, older men, younger men. And, and by the way, he told the older women to teach the younger women. You're like, wait a minute, time out. That's encroaching on my responsibility as a mom. No, the Bible says that other older women should partner with you in discipling your daughter. So Paul was addressing the ministry of the entire church there. Number five, we're almost done. The Family Integrated Church movement misrepresents church history. That's a strong statement, I know. But it appears from the little bit of research that I've done that, that they claim that age segregation is a new thing, which I think is highly questionable because you can read about John Calvin during the Reformation back in the 1600s or so was catechizing children in Geneva, apart from their parents, by the way, He'd have the parents drop him off at the church. In the mid-18th century, pastors like Jonathan Edwards would gather youth together for specific instruction that was distinct from the rest of the body of the church. Knowing Jonathan Edwards, he probably did camp glory. The claim that ministry-led classes or age-graded ministry-led classes to catechize children are a recent innovation that arose from pragmatic reasons I think seems to be on shaky ground. And then lastly, quickly, 
The family integrated church movement guarantees something that is not guaranteed. It guarantees something that is not guaranteed. Listen, I've seen lots of movements as you have come and go, all promising to be the solution to whatever problem the church is facing. And the family integrated church movement is no different. Listen, no parenting method or program can ensure our children are going to get saved and never walk away from the Lord. I don't care how biblical it is. God is sovereign over salvation. And if we forget that, we will be left discouraged and disillusioned by any man-made methodology. Listen, you could be the perfect parent attending the perfect church, but that is no guarantee that your child will be born again. Only the grace of God can accomplish that. It's not about whether they go to youth ministry or they don't. It's not about if they go to homeschool or public school. It's about God's sovereign grace. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for an opportunity just to stretch our minds a bit this morning on this contemporary issue that um, intersects with so many things in the life of our church. How appropriate today is with these young people sitting up front here, kind of segregated out as a group, but sitting right here with us. And we're so grateful for those that have taken the, the last several days to lovingly and selflessly and sacrificially pour into their lives the truth of your word and partnering with a heart to partner with parents, not to usurp parents' authority or to take away uh, the parents' responsibility, but just to come alongside parents and, and encourage them and support them and be a great asset to them. And so I pray you just continue to increase the partnerships in our church between parents and children's uh, Sunday school teachers and youth staff and, and everyone who's involved in, 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 in shepherding and discipling uh, lives here in this, in this local church. So, Lord, help us to, to think biblically, uh, not just about this subject, but every subject, Lord. Make us good Bereans who go back to the Bible and really test out the things that we've heard this morning to make sure that they, are, they line up with Scripture. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.